Um, it's gonna, I'm really hoping that I can keep you first all awake this afternoon, uh, but also I'm hoping that this will be uh, probably the most casual and formal part, but most informative part of the day. Um, the subject of this, the next panel discussion is multidisciplinary care for women in bleeding disorders. Um, it's, it's a subject that's very important to all of us in the room, and I think that uh, what, I've, what I've liked, uh, what I've planned for this afternoon is to go about giving you a bit of an introduction on the issue and why it's so important in, a, in more of a formal presentation for about 10 or 15 minutes, followed by uh, different clinics that will show how they do things locally. The clinics were chosen uh, partly because they do things differently. And so we wanted to present you with different ways of doing things, knowing full well that not everything's conducive to every setting. And so I'm hoping you'll get a little bit of a variety of an idea of how to set up multidisciplinary care for women. And uh, we'll have uh, sufficient time for questions. So we're hoping to get a lot, a lot of interesting discussion going. So I'm going to start off. Um, so why do we need multidisciplinary care for women? So I think the main reason is because women represent uh, up to two thirds of all registries. Um, women uh, in, every, in every clinic, in every hemophilia treatment center, regardless of the disorder underlying it, have more bleeding manifestations than men for the same diseases often. This is the second reason. <laughs> so women are not men and women have different needs. Women face bleeding challenges at time of menstruation, childbirth, and miscarriage. And so it's true that they bleed after surgery and men have those issues too, but women have particular issues that need to be addressed in this type of setting. There's also obstetrical bleeding, and I want to point this out. This is a, a graph that I took from, uh, from the internet uh, looking at uh, maternal mortality rates. And what you see here in sort of the, light, the lighter pale green here, looking at Western Europe and North America, we have actually the lowest mortality, uh, maternal mortality rate in the world. So there's something to be proud of. And what are the causes of maternal death? So the cause of maternal death, the number one leading cause in the world remains by far severe bleeding and postpartum hemorrhage. Looking at uh, mor maternal mortality by country, we can see that Canada fares very well uh, with one of the lowest uh, maternal mortality rates compared to other countries around the world like we've seen in the first graph. I want to point out something very interesting that I've learned recently, uh, and especially uh, talking to my anesthetist uh, colleagues in our clinic, and also by having reviewed recently a lot of the Health Canada statistics, uh, I actually was wondering what the number one cause is. I've heard a lot that it's uh, worldwide that it's hemorrhage. I wondered what it was in, in, in developed countries. Um, and what it is, is it's most deaths, direct cause of maternal mortality are from pulmonary embolism in pregnancy. Um, and these are statistics I'll point out from 2000. This is a more current uh, uh, graph that shows more recent data. And what you're going to see here is a flip in things, where you see that actually postpartum hemorrhage is actually a, 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 a more prevalent cause of maternal mortality or cause than obstetric embolism. And that's largely related to better thromb uh, thromboprophylaxis, um, especially in the publication on the thromboprophylaxis guidelines. So we've been very effective in treating thrombosis, and now hemorrhage has taken the lead in terms of maternal mortality. Um, the graph is a little misleading. It's hard to tell there's actually a decline in maternal mortality rates, and that's because I noticed uh, just yesterday that the graph is truncated here at 1998. But actually, if you look at the graph in 19, early 1900s, it's actually up here. And so what we've seen is, is actually a steady decline overall in maternal, uh, in maternal uh, mortality. The decline in maternal deaths is due to improved asepsis, fluid management, and blood transfusion, and better prenatal care. And I think that's a very important take-home message. I'm going to take a minute to read this because I think it's important. It's an excerpt that I found on the internet when I was looking at what the situation is like elsewhere in the world. And I'm going to read it word for word. While working in a remote Papua New Guinea last year with Doctors Without Borders or Médecins Sans Frontières, my team and I heard about a woman who recently died giving birth to twins. So we immediately left to check up on the newborn children. While there, we came up on another woman who was also in labor and carrying twins. After learning that she'd already had one stillbirth, we transferred her to our hospital. After a difficult and protracted delivery, two healthy baby boys arrived safely. Then what should have been a, remark a remarkable moment turned into a medical emergency uh, because there was a higher risk of bleeding after the delivery of twins, the young mother started to hemorrhage and lost over a quart of blood. We managed to control her bleeding with intravenous fluids and drugs, but without this medical care, this woman would have lost a lot more and might not have survived. As a midwife, I've witnessed 
firsthand, uh, sorry, that's a, a typo, and the immense challenges women face and have had the privilege of providing care in places such as Darfur, Madagascar, Sri Lanka, Papua New Guinea. After seeing the direct benefits of emergency obstetric care, I grieve for all the women around the world who aren't getting it. In most developing countries, access to health care is limited enough, and few women get the emergency assistance they need during pregnancy at the time of birth. And I, that, that gave me the shivers. Uh, this is a picture of the mother with her baby in what's called the new center of obstetrical emergencies in, in Burundi. It's not only for the obstetrical hemorrhage, though, that we need these type of clinics. I'm going to under and emphasize the, why, the pertinence for menorrhagia as well. And we've heard today, uh, in the last case, especially about a severe hemorrhage in somebody with von Willebrand type 3. And I point out again this, this, this pedigree where there's been a, a fatality related to extreme hemorrhage at the time of menarche or in a fourth menstrual period shortly after. And also, this type of thing has been reported in patients with Glantzman and Bernard Sully and probably underreported in other type of bleeding disorders. And while it's true that menorrhagia is common in, across the board in all types of bleeding disorders, we've also heard today that bleeding at menarche is often a sign of an underlying bleeding disorder and we should be paying attention to it. It seems to be that it's a sign a little bit more commonly associated with von Willebrand than rare factor deficiencies, but it's true to all of them. And I picked this not because it's from a scientific journal, but it's, the data is originally from a publication from, in Hemophilia. But this was, an art, this was an ad, and I know David Lillicrap was involved in this when it was published in the Medical Post. And what it shows is that the incidence of menorrhagia is very high in women with bleeding disorders, and you can see the graph. The other reason for having um, multidisciplinary care is because the frequency of bleeding disorders in women with menorrhagia is actually quite high. And what this graph, sh whoops, sorry. So what this graph shows here is that von Willebrand will be diagnosed in about 13%. That number could be as inflated as 40% in tertiary care centers and looking at adolescents in particular, and then other bleeding disorders. And so we need to be apt to be able to deal with these type of problems. Just looking at another way, you might say, well, how do we know if women are really bleeding? The PBAC score here is illustrating that compared to controls where their PBAC score is around under 100 here, you can see that women with factor 11 deficiency, von Willebrand, or carriers of hemophilia have scores that are considerably higher than 100, and so have menorrhagia by more semi-objective means. And so what we really require is a combined expertise, and I think in large part speaks to our efforts today uh, with the combined approach of the uh, AHCDC and the SOGC, where the hematology might contribute uh, in terms of helping with the diagnostic of bleeding disorders, specific treatments for bleeding or prevention of bleeding, and certainly have some expertise in transfusion. And from obstetrics and gynecology, I mean really the, the basis of all treatment uh, of menorrhagia, postpartum hemorrhage, and certainly the leading experts in hormonal therapy of all types. So women in bleeding disorders, multidisciplinary clinics, as we can see, living in Canada is a major privilege. We have health care coverage in most cases and for most things, except for iron, uh, we're <laughs> uh, Access to tertiary care centers is, is somewhat easy, uh, and these women can benefit from multidisciplinary approaches, uh, and especially in specialized clinics for women in bleeding disorders. So these are some recent statistics, and thank you, Claire, for uh, helping me uh, get this information and from the CHR um, to get some recent data in Canada that I wanted to share with you. So looking at the number of Canadian women with inherited bleeding disorders, and these are recent statistics from 2001, you can see that um, in 2010, there were 2,048 women diagnosed with von Willebrand disease, and now uh, 2,111. In 2010, in platelet function, we had 319. It's gone up to 380. And I think this is largely due to sense, sense, you know, sensibilization efforts uh, and increased testing. Uh, hemophilia, similar numbers went from 264 to 292. And the rare factor deficiencies as a group uh, from 430 to 440. So the number of Canadian women overall infected by a bleeding disorder registered in Canada today, 3,223. That's enormous. Um, in the publication of the SOGC clinical practice guidelines, it's recommended to manage women with bleeding disorders in these type of clinics. Um, there are some benefits, and uh, these are not been studied by formal, but certainly subjective reports of women feeling uh, more taken care of and uh, in, in feeling that they have that security that we heard a lot about that was missing. This was the thing that comes out mostly, but also having the combined expertise to be able to deal with bleeding problems when faced with them of any nature. The other thing that makes me very proud for the accomplishments in this room and for this group is that uh, in the last survey that was sent out by the Canadian Hemophilia Society, um, 
we now have what we think, and please correct me if I don't have the data up to date. Uh, we think it's the most up to date we had, but we have eight clinics of this nature of, in Canada. And you can see that in Nova Scotia, two in Quebec, three in Ontario, one in Saskatchewan, one in Alberta. And that, I think the number when we compared to the questionnaire before that uh, was five or six. And so we've gone up three women in bleeding disorders clinics in the last uh, year or two. That's absolutely remarkable. Um, in the Canadian Hemophilia Society strategic planning, uh, I'm going to highlight what their desired outcomes are. All comprehensive care clinics will have introduced services for women with inherited bleeding disorders. And that's the nature of the discussion we're about to have. What are, what are the nature of those services and what can they look like and in what form may they take? I was asked by, uh, by Claire especially to give a little bit of a how-to guide. And I have to give a big parenthesis here because I wasn't at St. Justine when it was created. It was Dr. Rard that was there, and we're going to get to that in a few minutes. But I did my best to give you just a little bit of idea of the major steps that have to be taken in order to make it happen. Um, they seem simple because the slides are simple, but actually it's a process that's quite complicated. But basically, I think the first step always is identifying the need. Are there sufficient numbers of women that you feel require these services? Are there nearby similar centers offering the same thing? So in other words, if there's someone down the street offering a similar clinic, maybe your hospital doesn't need one. And I think you need to reach consensus on the need. The next thing is the setting conducive. Does it have the right setup? So for example, do you have on-site obstetricians and gynecologists? I think a type of clinic like this without an on-site gynecologist would be difficult. An on-site blood bank, rapid access to blood products, and uh, in our case, a site or accessible in neonatal critical care for the hemophiliac that's born to a hemophiliac carrier. Then laying the groundwork, I think, is a question of cross-educating each other, established common objectives, determined goals identify the players, and that's probably one of the most important points. It all falls apart if you don't point fingers, and I, Dr. Rivar taught me that. Uh, if you don't say you are gonna carry the flag for this and you are gonna do that, it's, the people won't assume that responsibility and things tend to fall apart. Uh, obtain administrative approval, um, and then ap establish operational procedures. So pick the model that you think works best in your institution. Um, for example, are they the same day visits with the hematologist and the obstetrician? Um, do you want protocols for the delivery and issues on perinatal care? Um, and in what forum would you discuss difficult cases? Will it be live at the time of the visit? Will it be in a separate meeting? These are all things that really have to be adapted to individual requirements. Does everyone know who that is? One dollar. It's the count from Sesame Street. So I think you need to find the money. Uh, you can be imaginative. This can come from outside funding. This can come from inside funding. It may be, be able to be piggybacked at a fairly low cost onto your hemophilia treatment center. And certainly, it would help to get hospital administrative approval. So I'm just, before I pass the, 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 uh, the mic over to my colleague, who's our, uh, our, our, our nurse coordinator of the clinic, uh, Catherine Thibault, who's sitting next to me, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a bird's eye view of what it looks like at St. Justine in our program. So this is a picture of the hospital um, from down the street. Uh, this is a university affiliated tertiary care referral center for mother and child. It, we have a high-risk pregnancy program uh, that's separate from ours. Tertiary Care Center for Neonatology, and it's a designated hemophilia treatment center. And of course, and back in 1999, before I was there, it took someone to have the vision. And you know, at the time, uh, we concentrated only on hemophilia and, and a disease of, of largely um, men and boys. And Dr. Rivard had the insight at that time to say, let's, be, let, let's create something for women clearly that clearly the, the needs are not, are not the same. And so uh, he had the vision. And he also has what I call the magic or the voodoo. He sort of just like, makes things happen. And, and you don't always know how it happens, but it just does. Um, and that's a little bit what happened before I got there. And then he picks his victims. Um, and the victims that were picked at that time were Diane Franker, who we've heard today, and Michelle David, who unfortunately had to leave to catch the train home. Uh, but these were the people that were there initially. And it would be unfair to do this presentation without mentioning that Claudine was the first uh, nurse coordinator of this clinic, and there have been two others uh, since uh, Catherine joined us. Um, I've been the second phase victim, so uh, when, Michelle, when I came on uh, with an interest in this field, uh, Michelle uh, stepped down and handed me over this, uh, this position, which I accepted uh, very graciously. 
The team looks like this. It started off uh, just the three of them, actually, and then we added an anesthetist who actually trained in bleeding disorders. That was her fellowship. Uh, I became the clinical director. We have an internist, a pediatrician, who's actually in the audience somewhere here. Um, we associated with a, a laboratory technician who comes to our meetings, and a pharmacist who's a specialist in, in medications used for women uh, in pregnancy and, uh, and certainly with menorrhagia. And now we've acquired an administrative assistant and a psychologist only part-time who sees the, the most severe uh, patients. Uh, it's a huge group, I have to say, and I'm, I'm actually proud of this. This has grown over time, and I, and I think that, um, don't be jealous, but it's just, <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's just, it's something that happened, and it really is something, this list, if I showed it five years ago, we would have had 10 people on it or five people on it. And what it really shows to me is that people are more and more interested to participate and move these things forward. And so most of the people that you see on the list since the last list was updated are people that have come forward and said, I want to be a part of that. And I think that's a very important message is that pointing the fingers at the beginning, getting people going is, is very important. But I think it's also important to listen. When people say, I'm interested, please accept because I think that we need mo all the help we can get. Um, again, this is a patient-centered approach. I showed you a huge name, a whole list of team, but at the center of our approach is the mother and the patient. Um, and just to end with a couple of slides about what we really see, we, most of our consults are for menorrhagia. Some of them are for uh, women with bleeding disorders who are pregnant, uh, a large part, 20%. And when we look at uh, issues related to postpartum hemorrhage, so undiagnosed patients who come with a diagnosis of postpartum hemorrhage, and others who have other coagulation abnormalities or thrombosis. 80% are physician referred, 20% are self referred. This may vary in clinics. Um, there's, a, I think, a site on the CHS website that allows women to self refer and give contact numbers uh, through the CHS uh, that can refer to clinics. Um, not every institution can do that. Uh, there are internal uh, consults mostly, and about half, no, should I say mostly, but they come internally about half the time and from external uh, doctors uh, half, the other half of the time, and 43% come from general practitioners in the community. The target population are adolescent women to menopausal women. As at St. Justine, we see children and adults, uh, women with menorrhagia or postpartum hemorrhage, women with hemostasis abnormalities that contribute to their bleeding symptoms, but also we see patients who don't have a diagnosed bleeding problem yet, but have impaired quality of life related to excessive bleeding. The objectives are to establish the correct diagnosis, like we've heard today, because it's really important to establish the correct treatment plan, uh, to ensure that local treatment practices are in keeping with the highest standards, and of course we promote clinical research uh, as, a, as a multidisciplinary group. And what it looks like overall is patients are referred, either auto-referred or referred from another physician. It passes through the clinic coordinator, then the consults get prioritized by the hematologist based on their notion of, of, of urgency to be seen. Um, I will let Catherine give you the details of what she does, but then it goes through the hands of the nurse coordinator. Then there's a visit planned either in the hematology department or gynecology department at first, and then the other department subsequently, and then there's crosstalk. What happens after is that once they're seen by both hematology and obstetrics, if there's a clear diagnosis and treatment, it stops there. If it's unclear because the diagnosis is uncertain or there's waiting on, on a subsequent testing, or it's a very controversial issue in management, uh, we then bring it to multidisciplinary rounds, which you heard uh, Dr. Franquer talk to us every Tuesday morning between eight and nine. And then we come out of that with a written summary and a plan, uh, and we send copies to the patient. And so the role of multidisciplinary rounds are really to discuss those difficult patients and come up with a tailored treatment plan. This is a little bit what it looks like. We have a, a, our secretary sends out every week uh, the activity of the week. Uh, we have integrated journal clubs into ours uh, on women and bleeding disorders. So every three weeks we present a journal club. And in, treat, in practice, we use protocols and we use emergency. We have emergency access and we have a lot of documentary procedures which Ka Catherine will show us. And at the end of the day, we diagnose about half von Willebrand and other bleeding disorders. And the last slide is just to show you that at St. Justine, our last numbers, we just tallied them together, uh, thanks to Catherine, who, who put it together for me, uh, a total of 372 patients with von Willebrand, of which 219 are women, most of whom uh, are type 1, which is what you would expect. And we have eight uh, type 3 von Willebrand patients, of whom four are women. And so these are very big numbers, and it's just one of the reasons we're here today is to see how we can do better for them. So I'm going to pass the microphone to Catherine, and what we're going to do is we're going to open up our session to five minutes of questions, 
and then we're going to hear three other clinics tell their way of doing things, and then we'll have an open discussion afterwards. Yours. My name is Catherine Thibault. I'm the nurse coordinator for the Von Wolbrand Disease Program at St. Justin Hospital, working with Dr. Winnikoff and Dr. Franquer. I'm going to introduce you to my role as a nurse coordinator for women and bleeding disorders. I will explain to you how patients come to our clinic for their first consultation, the tools we use for the education and the follow-ups that we do. So usually uh, patients come to our clinic for their first consultation uh, by two appointments. The first uh, appointment is only with me and I try to get as much as information I can get. So first of all, I do nursing initial interview, I practice blood tests and I explain to the patient how the clinic works, I support them and I reassure them. So these are the information I try to get. Um, personal bleeding history, other health problems, I draw family history. I draw family tree if the family's history is positive. I ask if she takes any medication, other health, natural health products, hormone therapy. And I ask if she had any previous experience with contraceptive pills or other methods, hormonal contraceptive methods. And I ask about her gynecological history, about her surgeries, her pregnancies, her therapeutic or spontaneous abortions. So if the patient consulting us is pregnant, I just add a few more questions like number of weeks of gestation and her obstetrical history. These are the usual blood tests that we include to the first visit. So it takes a complete blood count, iron studies, Blood group and the first coagulation test includes these. Yana rapidity, fibrinogen, closure time, and <coughs> complete von Willebrand profile. So this is a document that we use. Uh, I think it's really useful. We uh, enter the lab results in this sheet and we have a special, um, special space to uh, add uh, and to note if the patient was uh, at the time of the test breastfeeding she was pregnant or she was taking hormones. So before meeting with the hematologist on the day of the appointment, I just note if she takes any other medication. I ask if there's any new bleeding problem that has occurred since last appointment and we take vital signs and wait. After meeting the hematologist, um, we support a lot of the patients uh, we complete the education and verify the patient's level of comprehension. We provide documents to support the management of the diagnosis. We give instructions if medication is prescribed. We coordinate different appointments with either the gynecologist or other healthcare professionals. And we register in charms and give a factor first card if the diagnosis is clearly established. So these, this is a tool we use. These are brochures for our patients about cyclocapron, BDAVP, all about vomit brand disease, and uh, another book for our women with menorrhagia or bleeding disorders. So after the appointment, um, we organize different follow-ups, um, so either annual review or as needed. And for postpartum follow-ups, we do a lot of counseling on the normality of postpartum bleeding. We suggest a follow-up two weeks postpartum with the hematologist and of course the gynecologist. And we remind redoing the coagulation test if the diagnosis wasn't clearly established prior to pregnancy. And the nurse has a link between the patient and the doctor. We receive the calls and uh, <laughs> we uh, manage to get the information to the doctor. At our clinic, there's an hemostasis nurse on call 24 hours and seven days a week for emergencies, not only for women, but for hemophiliacs too. Patients have, are learned that they have the responsibility to contact us, their nurse coordinator, if they have problems like menorrhagia, dental work, they need preparation for surgeries, etc. So that's our role at the clinic.
Thank you very much, Catherine. I couldn't have done that because there's so much that goes on that I don't see. Um, I think that what we're going to do is we're going to take five minutes of questions related to our clinic, the way we do things. Um, we, we constantly change because, you know, we learn things from our colleagues that are starting up their own clinics and learn things that we're doing well and things that we're not doing right. And we listen to the patients uh, where we can do better. And so we consider ourselves a clinic that's constantly in dynamics and constantly changing, trying to improve. Um, I wonder if there's any questions from the audience in terms of concrete things that uh, from anyone, even from the CHS. <laughs> Nothing at all. Just want to know if the documentation is available on the web for us <laughs> and so for the, our patients. So actually, the documentation that Catherine showed is there's, mm -hmm. these are Canadian uh, publications. And so they're available through the CHS, all okay. of them. On the not, these are not exclusive to us. These are uh, documents on, on the medications uh, across Canada. On the web already? Uh, is, uh, on the web, yeah. David tells me. Yeah, yeah. I, I thank you very much for bringing that up because it's something I've been advocating for uh, for, for, for a few years now. Um, for various reasons, it's, ho it's difficult with hospital politics to get a full-time social worker or psychologist. That's the truth. But we do have uh, Suzanne Duenard, who's a psychologist, uh, largely working with, uh, and she was, on the, she was actually on the list, but she was also in that uh, big target that I showed as the last person that joined uh, peripherally the team. And what she sees is she sees the patients that we designate. We, I think all of them should be seen, is what I think. And my ultimate goal would have a full-time psychologist working with us. And so I think each woman with any, I mean, we've, we've heard different cases, but I, I can probably attest to the fact that most patients that come to the clinic should at least have one visit and then determine all, you know, afterwards if they need to continue or not. But right now, we're just referring on an as-needed basis the women uh, to, a, to a psychologist who actually has a lot of experience with hemophilia and, hemophilia car and carriers of hemophilia. Um, and she's doing us that service for now. Uh, I, I think that if we would have the chance to have either a social worker or a psychologist with us, obviously all women would need to be seen because, you know, there's a lot of guilt around uh, bleeding disorder, being the one who transmitted that disease to your child, and women have a hard time to go through that. After that is done, when it's time to uh, be pregnant or have a surgery, these women are afraid to die. And you know, sometimes, unfortunately, it doesn't go that well as expected. So when we have somebody around to help us to accept the risk and uh, be reassured and feel better about what's coming, it helps a lot for, for us. Uh, I was just wondering, given your deep experience with having a gynecologist or OBGYN as part of your team there, uh, for, the, for those of us who are uh, involved in clinics that don't have uh, OBGYN as part of the bleeding disorders team, do you have any recommendations on how to best um, you know, bring together the outside? I'm a patient, so you know, sometimes you are feel like you're not sure where to go first. I'm just wondering if you have any recommendations in that regard. Um, you know, when I, when I mentioned that it would be ideal, it doesn't mean that it's always possible. So I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that it's prohibitive to have a clinic if you don't have an on-site gynecologist as part of the team. But I, I think that there are imaginative ways to do so. And for example, if it's a gynecologist in the hospital, but that's not part of the team, you could imagine that there might be a, you know, a time that you would allot to have sort of a, you know, interdisciplinary rounds, for example, without having to see each other more than once a week and just go over the you know, issues related to those patients. Other issues, if it's a gynecologist outside the hospital, there's no reason that that person couldn't be invited to a platform to assist at your hospital to go over certain patients that you feel that need to, uh, or not in your hospital, but I'm saying that you know, they can be invited to the hospital and uh, invited to rounds and, and go over their patients that they're following in a clinic outside the hospital. I think that's also possible. I don't know if any of my Canadian colleagues have any comments as to other ideas to... Did Chef talk about that? Uh, ideally, you know, with uh, being involved with SOGC, we'll, we will try to have uh, people from all over Canada, from uh, the Atlantic to the West, to be 
at least available close to your home. And uh, even if people don't have all the setup, they can always uh, call us. It's on our things of list to do. <laughs> but we, we plan to have video conference available starting probably in six months to be able to, do, uh, to help people who just want to discuss cases with us. Because we are very lucky to have uh, and we, are, we have fun together on Tuesday morning, so yeah. that's why people kept on coming, coming, coming every, every week. So uh, it, we are lucky to have all the expertise. I mean, it's, uh, it's from the pharmacist who uh, has a special interest in natural product that can make you bleed to the anesthesiologists who have other experience. So uh, it's going to help people to, um, if they don't have all that staff, to at least discuss with us. And usually what we do, because because uh, we don't uh, steal patients from other gynecologists who are good as well. We just send a letter of recommendation telling what we would recommend because, you know, after all these years, we've learned a few things that are sometimes very uh, technical points like uh, uh, women with bleeding disorder don't heal well, so they have much more wound infection. The, we need to leave the suture for two weeks and all kind of uh, little details like that that you learn on the road. And we are happy to put that in a letter for your doctor if it's needed. I think that's a good point. So the idea is not necessarily to concentrate everyone to the hemophilia treatment centers as much as it is to get uh, a multidisciplinary expert advice on how to handle a situation that individuals outside the hemophilia treatment center might not be in contact with often. And I think that's what the key is. It's, it's exactly what you say. It's not necessary to, 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 to grab everyone in, but to give everyone the tools that they need to be able to handle it properly on the, on the outside. The new challenge since a few years is the immigrants with a lot of language and sometimes they don't understand, they don't, we don't have an interpret. Do you have some tools uh, like the pamphlet but in other language than the French and the English? I, I, would, I would defer to the Canadian Hemophilia Society. No, just so in French and English. It's a, it's a um, need eh, for us. But what we do is, we, we, like any other patient, I think if we're faced with that problem, uh, just recently we had a, a, a girl with von Willebrand uh, severe, type 1, very severe actually. Um, and she was unilingual Spanish. We had a translator. And I think it's not easy, but eventually you get used to it and they, they, they come with a translator. And uh, she feels comfortable now, I think. Mm -hmm. But maybe there's a website with the WHO uh, who have other language uh, pamphlet or something. You don't know about that? Yeah. Is there a project in the and it's av available on the uh, okay thanks. thank you um, and I just was asked to mention that there's a uh, brochure if you don't have it it's available on the website uh, Claire is it? Oh, it's in the bag even. Okay, even better. The Management of Women with Bleeding Disorders that was, uh, that was published by uh, the Women's and Bleeding Disorders Subcommittee uh, headed by Christine Demersa, who's in the audience somewhere at that time. Uh, but very helpful guide. It will be revised in the next couple of years, but it's in your bags. So if there are no other questions for our clinic, I'm gonna call upon the next clinic. Um, I'm just gonna get the order right here. So this is the Calgary Clinic, and I'm gonna call upon Dr. Don Gidier and Carol Spitzer to come talk to us about uh, how they work in their clinic. Thank you for accepting. Well, I'm delighted to actually have the opportunity to participate today. Um, it's very nice to actually get some reassurance and see what we're actually doing right, but my list of things that we need to do better is actually growing, so I think I'm going to have a lot to take home after this. So I'm actually going to spend the next few minutes talking to you about our approach in Calgary um, to dealing with women with bleeding disorders, and then I'm going to hand over to, um, to Carol just to, to share a few words. So as you've heard, our clinic is designed in the general model for the comprehensive care clinic where the patient and their family are central. And then I look at it um, and consider two teams. One would be the core team, which would be those individuals that are involved in the day-to-day -day running of the clinic and sort of the day-to-day -day, um, 
uh, management of individuals with bleeding disorders. And so those would be our hematologists, our nurses, social workers, physiotherapists, our lab staff, blood bank, et cetera. And then we have our consultant team. So for us in Calgary, these individuals aren't directly involved in our clinic operations, but these are specific individuals that we've identified in our area that we can call on whenever there are individual patient needs. So as you've heard, certainly our, our gynecology colleagues are uh, incredibly important, but also things like we have an ear, nose, throat specialist, a dentist that we will call on as needed um, if there's a particular need. So this would be um, sort of the core, some, some of the photographs of our core team members. Um, unfortunately, right now we don't have a physiotherapist working with us, but we're hoping that that's going to be rectified in the next couple of months. And I'm incredibly excited, actually. We do have a social worker that works with us, but we also have a psychologist that will be coming on as a part of our core team within the next couple of months. And I think that that's going to be incredibly valuable, especially hearing what we've heard this morning about the quality of life issues uh, and the psychosocial impact that having a bleeding disorder can have on our patients. So for us, our clinic um, is an adult clinic. So we see women who are 18 years of age or over, older who already have a confirmed diagnosis of a bleeding disorder or a strongly documented family history. Um, if we have male patients, so individuals with hemophilia, and they've identified that there are female family members that haven't been tested, whether or not they're a part of our clinic, we will go ahead and arrange testing for them. And then if we determine that they are also at risk for having a bleeding disorder, then we will enroll them in our clinic. Um, and if not, well, then we, we give them that news and uh, send them on their way. Oftentimes, one of the questions come up as to when we're looking at female children, when should be, they be tested? And we do uh, a similar practice as you've heard earlier today. So generally, we recommend sort of 10 to 12 years um, just on, prior to onset of periods. If there are any parental concerns or family concerns that the, the child seems to be bleeding excessively or if they're scheduled to have an, any underlying invasive procedure, then we would recommend testing and arrange um, a referral to our pediatric colleagues at Alberta Children's Hospital. Because we see patients who already have a confirmed diagnosis, we take our referrals from other hematologists or other bleeding disorders clinics. If we actually get referrals, and we frequently do from other family physicians, other healthcare providers, um, and they're questioning a bleeding disorder or there's a, a sort of a, a distant family history, then what we will do is the hematologists that are involved in our clinic will see these patients in our individual clinics um, as an outpatient. And then once we've confirmed the diagnosis or identified what the specific bleeding issues are, then we make a decision as to whether this person would benefit from being a part of our clinic. Generally, we um, transmit communications to other medical professionals or our patients via mail-out uh, letter, but certainly if there's any um, urgent communication that's required, then we're more than happy to, to speak to them face-to-face -face or um, uh, use a telephone call to address whatever the issue is. So recently, when we looked at our data in, in um, our clinic, we are actually following 630 patients with bleeding disorders. And when we actually look at them, um, 228 of them are females. And not surprisingly, the majority of those women are uh, affected with von Willebrand's disease. Second to that, we have uh, carriers of factor VIII deficiency. And then we also have another significant group of women who don't have a defined bleeding disorder. So these would be women who have had certainly many uh, bleeding concerns in the past, but no matter uh, on repeated testing, we haven't been able to confirm what their diagnosis is. But because of concerns, because of their bleeding history, we will continue to follow them in our clinic. And so then um, we actually hold our comprehensive review clinics every two weeks, and we see both men and women during our clinic. So we don't actually have a dedicated women with bleeding disorders clinic. Several years ago, an attempt was made to do that, but for a variety of reasons, it just didn't work with our clinic and with our patient population to have a separate clinic where we only saw uh, women. So now we just have a mixed gender clinic. And what we do is the core team, as I showed you earlier, will meet in a pre-clinic. So we take an hour before the clinic is due to start and we'll review the patient issues, um, what their bleeding history has been, any issues at their last visit, and then we'll make a plan for how we approach the patient interaction during that clinic appointment. 
the patient will then um, see that the hematologist and nurse together, and then the other members of the core team as necessary. And then once the clinic is completed that day, we will then have a post-clinic conference where we just update the other members of the core team about what the new issues were so that we're all on board with the same plan going forward. Depending on the particular bleeding disorder of the woman involved, then we will see them every six months to two years, depending on what the issues are. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we will then call on our consult uh, team as needed. So um, we are fortunate to um, work closely with Dr. Baranowski in Calgary, who unfortunately was uh, unable to join us today. But she's been a great resource for our clinic in um, dealing with the gynecologic and obstetrical issues. And of course, she sees our patients very quickly, but until we can actually uh, get them into her clinic, we'll do our best to uh, manage whatever the bleeding issue is. And I just have a couple of slides to show some of the, the ways that we've tried to address some of the other issues, one of which being um, providing instructions at the time of delivery. So um, we've done up a series of generic letters. Um, the one that's depicted here is for factor eight deficiency. Um, so women who are carriers of factor eight deficiency. And what these letters, so we've done it for factor eight deficiency, nine and 11. And what it does is it provides some uh, general recommendations to um, either the obstetrician, family physician, or midwife who will be delivering the, the baby. Um, and it just provides some um, information about the bleeding disorder and provides some context for our management orders. Um, these letters also provide some recommendations for the investigation and management of the child potentially at risk for having hemophilia, and we did that in conjunction with our pediatric colleagues. Of course, given that the majority of our women have von Willebrand's disease, we also developed a similar letter specifically um, identifying issues specific to von Willebrand's disease. We get all of our women to come into clinic for hemostasis testing at about 36 weeks gestational age, although we ask them to let us know of their pregnancy as soon as they know. Um, and uh, based on those third trimester levels, in addition to this particular generic letter, we will then sp send specific recommendations as to whether the individual requires factor replacement or DDVP or whether they don't need anything at all. And we will provide the um, obstetrician also a, a copy of their levels at that point as well. Um, oftentimes we provide this letter to the individual female patients themselves as well so that they have a copy, but that's one of the things that I've recognized that we need to do a little bit of a better job at. And then the last thing that I wanted to highlight that we've done recently is that we found that, of course, as you've heard today, these women are certainly at risk for postpartum hemorrhage. And what we found is that we would often tell these women, you know, what to expect and what to be on the lookout for in terms of excessive postpartum bleeding. But of course, for the majority of them, those are the risks that are highest when they're at home with a new baby and are quite busy where their own health care is actually the least of their worries. And so we've had situations where there have been mothers that have had to go to the emergency department several times before they actually think to let us know where we become involved. So what we've tried to do is to provide them with a pamphlet um, that we give them when they come in for their third trimester blood work. And what it does is it explains to the, to the mom why we're actually doing their levels in the third trimester, um, describes their, when they're at risk for bleeding, and also suggests that they don't use anti-inflammatory drugs in the po postpartum period just to avoid any excessive bleeding. And then it also, that sort of, this is the backside of it. And then the other thing it goes on to describe is what's normal postpartum bleeding, which is typically um, can be, bleeding can be experienced for up to six weeks with the first several weeks being heaviest and the passage of clots, and then it should gradually dissipate over time. Um, so we explain that in this pamphlet. And then we also provide um, clues that the woman should be on the lookout for as um, a sign that maybe things aren't going the way it should. So if they're changing their pad more frequently than every two hours, if they're passing large clots. And we suggest that they actually contact us if that happens. Um, recognizing that in these situations, oftentimes there may be a gynecologic issue that needs to be addressed. But um, in order to avoid these women being untreated, we've just uh, advocated for us being the point person to help direct that as needed. So I'm just going to hand it over to Carol for a few moments. 
Thank you. I don't have too much to add because I don't want to repeat things that people have already mentioned. Um, we do talk about quality of life questions with um, women clarifying what what is normal within their family. Um, if if they've had to restrict their activities or change their plans because of their bleeding and clarifying what's normal. But one thing no one's talked about today and uh, we've noticed is um, a lack of knowledge or different percep perceptions from women coming from different countries. I can think of one woman um, last year who came from Western Europe, but uh, when she knew she was carrying a boy, wanted to uh, have an abortion because she didn't want to have a son that went through um, the same situations as many of the uh, male members of her family did previously. So we did some counseling with her and uh, she came around, kept her pregnancy, and uh, delivered a healthy boy who did not have hemophilia. And last year, we had a nurse working with us from China, and she ex um, expressed surprise that um, for a woman carrying a child, um, who was no a woman who was known to be a hemophilia carrier, carrying a male child, that that wasn't an automatic reason for an abortion in Canada. Um, so we just need to be really cognizant of uh, educating women who particularly have come from different cultures to us. So thank you very much. I'm actually going to use that just stay up here for questions first. I'm going to try to take some questions immediately. Are there any questions for about the, we're going to come, we're going to have a general question period at the end, but any pressing questions to understand how things work in Calgary that maybe wouldn't have been clear or think suggestions? Yeah, and, and I think that certainly in the incidents that uh, Carol had talked about, that was certainly the, the um, situation. Um, but again, I think that's where as a clinic, a multidisciplinary clinic, we have the ability then to describe how hemophilia and the treatment of hemophilia has changed. Um, and in that particular individual, it certainly created a whole new uh, mind shift in terms of um, no matter, at the end, no matter whether the child was found to have hemophilia or not, she had decided that she would keep the child. So I, again, I think that education is a key part of what we can do. Any other questions? I do abortion in obstetrics and abortion at Morgan Teller Clinic. And sometimes a woman have a lot of reason to have an abortion, not just one. And sometimes they just tell one reason what it's acceptable to us, she think. And what she, it's not acceptable, she will not say it. Then I hope the social worker at your clinic explore all of these reasons because sometimes we transfer our values of, no, hemophilia now we treat well and there's a lot of treatment, but maybe there's other reasons she cannot or don't want another child, then uh, it's what I want to say. Certainly, and I think our goal is, um, and, and our mandate is to provide education without judgment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if a woman identifies the potential for having a hemophiliac child as being an issue, then we can certainly provide education, but at the end of the day, the decision is hers. Mm -hmm. And like you suggest, there can certainly be other reasons. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of time, yeah. there's a lot of reasons. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Any other comments? I was just wondering, um, you know, Alberta is a bit different for, uh, in terms of than Montreal or Quebec in terms of rural versus 
urban, what have you noticed in your clinic, perhaps women who are from smaller towns and quite far away, um, how has that modified how you've given advice in that setting or how you change your multidisciplinary model? Don, I'll let you answer that first and then I'll add something. Okay. <laughs> Certainly that's always a challenge. Um, and we, pro we try to provide as much outreach and education to the, um, to the sites where closest to the, to the women. But I think what's actually been most effective is, again, educating the woman herself so that she knows what she needs to look out for and what her therapies are so that when she goes to the emergency department, she can, um, as you've heard this morning, say what her disorder is and, and what she needs to get. But it is always something that we struggle with. And um, probably one of the most common issues is actually um, getting them to follow up at clinic. So, you know, we can schedule routine follow-ups and we do want to see them at certain times, but if they're doing well and, you know, it's a four-hour drive, then oftentimes we may not find that they're, they are necessarily as compliant as we would like to see. Okay, and again, we're gonna open up for general questions for all the clinics afterwards. I wanna thank you very much. Now I'd like to call upon uh, actually Dr. Paula James, Dr. Ma'am Jameson, and Sherry Purcell to represent the Kingston <laughs> Clinic. Do, do you think it would work if the three of us sat, Rochelle? Because I, I think yeah, Sherry and, yeah, great. Okay, so um, I'm going to sort of drive here, but um, Sherry and Marianne will pipe in whenever I say anything wrong or um, at my request. Yeah, right. Okay, so um, just to give a bit of background um, for some context about Kingston and what's a little bit unique about our center, um, the clinic was established there. Uh, almost 30 years ago, um, and Sherry became the nurse coordinator the year after it started. And so we have... <laughs> Which means I'm old. I'm very old. No, that, I didn't mean that at all. It means that... <laughs> what it means is that she knows a lot about, about inherited bleeding disorders and actually really has been at the forefront of recognizing the importance of addressing women's issues um, within these clinics. We also have a long history of research um, focused on inherited bleeding disorders in clinic uh, in Kingston, and Alan Giles and David Lillycrap um, have long established research programs there that I've been fortunate enough to get involved in more recently. We also run the National Mutation Detection Program for Bleeding Disorders in Kingston, and I alluded to that earlier. Jane Legos here in the audience, who's the technologist who runs that program, and so we provide um, genetic testing for hemophilia, von Willebrand's disease, and occasionally for other rare bleeding disorders. We also have a very excellent um, special coagulation lab, and Louise Dwyer, who's the senior tech uh, for that lab, is here as well. And increasingly, that lab is starting to act as a referral center for other labs um, for testing for bleeding disorders. So it was within that context that we decided um, in 2004 to think about setting up a women in bleeding disorders clinic. And so the first thing that happened was Mariana Silva and I, um, Mariana's the pediatric hematologist who's involved in the clinic, went to visit Georges and Rochelle. And so we went to the source to find out um, how to do this properly and gave us some good ideas about how they had done things and then took that back and, and tried to figure out what was gonna work um, given the details of our, uh, of our location. So we had our first clinic in May of 2005, um, and the clinic, the first gynecologist that we had involved with our clinic was Dr. Stephanie Palerm, who left the summer of 2010. And we had a period of time when the clinic actually wasn't running. Um, and then very thankfully in February of 2011, Marianne Jameson joined us. And I can tell you that my dedication to this program uh, went up when I didn't have it because I realized how good we were at taking care of our patients and how much I missed that close link with gynecology when I didn't have it. 
And so we got our clinic back um, a little over a year ago. Um, we're organized similar to some of the other programs. We have some core team members um, and then some other folks we can call in if needed and place it, identified people who we refer to. So the core team um, is myself and Mariana. Uh, Marianne Jamison, who actually um, is involved with adult and pediatric adolescent gynecology. And so we see adults and teenage girls in this clinic and we have one gynecologist who's expert at both. We have two nurse coordinators, Sherry and Lisa Thebo, who's been with our team for a year or two. Um, and then we're always doing research, and so my clinical research assistant, Julie, is usually in clinic with us as well. We set up our program under the umbrella of the Inherited Bleeding Disorders Clinic, mostly so that we could have access to some of these folks, um, social work and physiotherapy. I am highly jealous of the clinics that have psychologists involved, and that's actually one of the things that's on my list to think about when we go home. Uh, we have an excellent social worker, Madeline um, Borden, who's, I'm not sure she's here, but she was here this morning, who really helps us out. Ah, there's Madeline. Um, best social worker in the planet. Um, and then physiotherapy, if needed. Um, the physiotherapist for our clinic, Kathy Walker. Um, we have our favorite anesthetist that we will um, get involved if needed. He happens to be my husband. And we don't provide obstetrical care in the context of this clinic. And that's a departmental quirk about Kingston. Um, I am involved in the management with a maternal fetal medicine specialist. Um, but you're going to see that the reason, uh, the, our reason for referral and the patients that we're seeing are a little bit different because we aren't directly doing obstetrical care in this clinic. So we have clinic once per month. It's a half-day clinic. We see up to 16 patients per clinic. We on the fly discuss management during clinic, but then we meet once a month as well um, to talk about all of the patients that we've seen and to firm up and clarify the management plans. Um, the kinds of patients that we see are women who have diagnoses, so von Willebrand's disease, carriers, women with platelet function disorders. We also see, like many of the other clinics, women who don't have a diagnosis. And in our clinic, we call them the bleeders NYD. Uh, NYD means not, di not yet diagnosed. We're hopeful that someday we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, and we occasionally see thrombosis patients in this clinic as well. We don't take direct referrals from outside. And this is a change we used to. When Steph and I started the clinic with Mariana, we used to see brand new patients to everybody in this clinic, and it didn't work. Um, when you're trying to run a clinic with three docs, new patient assessments at that level, it really bogged us down. And so what we do now um, is similar to Calgary, where if we get a new referral, whoever the patient was sent to sees that person first in their individual clinic and then we funnel ourselves. So somebody from the team funnels women into this clinic. So the, the patients are known to at least one of the MDs, which has helped to facilitate just running the clinic, I think, a little bit more smoothly. We often see mothers and daughters in the same clinic, which is, which is a delight for us. Um, I'm going to ask Marianne to comment on this, but one of the things I think that's really important, especially for adolescents, is this concept of one-stop shopping. Um, and so do you want to add, or are you just good with that? Oh, good with that. Okay. <laughs> hey, I've got stuff to add, thank you, not on that one. Okay. Um, and I think it is nice, uh, especially for patients who are traveling, not to have to make two trips, um, that they come and they see all of us um, at the same time. Um, the most reason, uh, the most common chief complaint is menorrhagia. Uh, we also do premenarchal visits, though, if there's a identified family history. Um, we'll do um, assessments for hemorrhagic ovarian cysts, and then we'll run the perioperative management for patients who Marianne is going to take to the OR through this program. We see our patients in follow-up in the context of this clinic as well, unless they've had definitive therapy. Um, and usually we try to follow up sort of three or four month intervals, especially if we've made a change in management, and then we will space that out, and if everything is running smoothly, we go to annual visits. If somebody's had a hysterectomy, that's what I mean by defini definitive management, or is postmenopausal, then um, they will, their follow-up will flip um, over to the other clinic um, and not this clinic anymore. So I just wanted to put up some clinic numbers. Uh, we started in 2005, and in the seven years that we've been running this clinic, our clinic numbers have over doubled. 
Um, and there has been some growth in the column for hemophilia. This is primarily carriers. Um, but the biggest growth is von Willebrand's disease. Um, and so we've gone from 144 to 309. I still don't think we have everybody. If you take a look at the catchment area that we serve, we should have 1,000 patients in our clinic. Um, and so there still are people in our area who are not diagnosed. Um, one of the things that we've had a lot of fun being involved in is um, people coming to visit us. We went to visit Georges and Rochelle when we started. Uh, we hosted um, Calgary when they were getting rolling, when Shannon was still in Calgary and Manchu. And so they came to see us in 2009. We had a lot of fun. Um, and if you want to come see us, we're delighted. And if you're lucky, maybe the dogs will have just had puppies. <laughs> and so this is us at the, over at the Hemophilia Dog Colony. And I love the look on David's face in this picture. Um, and we're actually very excited that next month, um, there's going to be a team from St. Mike's who are going to come out and visit us um, in preparation for hopefully starting a clinic here in Toronto. Uh, we love research, and we are actively recruiting for four studies right now. Um, so Julie is often the busiest person in clinic. We also are very dedicated to education, um, and we've been really fortunate in the last few years in Kingston to have people come to do um, post-specialty training with us. So we've had Natalia Rids for the last two years, and Emily Rimmer, who's coming to join us from Winnipeg, um, which will be lots of fun. And the clinic has a long history of being involved in educational events. Sherry is on the organizing committee of everything. Um, and we also, many of us, um, are fortunate enough to get to talk about what we're so passionate about um, on many occasions. And I just wanted to highlight this presentation, which Marianne Jameson gave a few months ago here in Toronto. Uh, and this was an inter interdepartmental or a, a, a citywide departmental round where she focused on the issues of adolescent um, bleeding. And then I actually am going to force you to talk now. Um, Marianne, I think we are so fortunate to have her involved in our clinic because she has a history of involvement in a number of important organizations um, providing obstetrical and gynecologic care. Um, and I'm just going to ask her to comment on, on the two that I have listed here, Marianne. Well, it's nice that Dr. Senecas was here because um, actually when I was about three months, no, wait a minute, six weeks postpartum with my first child, one of the executive director of SOGC called and said they wanted to start the new subspecialty group, Canadian Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecologists and Obstetricians. And uh, myself and Dr. Natalie Fleming from Ottawa were to co-chair this, and we were both six weeks postpartum. And I think we said yes out of a total sleep deprivation. But the committee, uh, there's members, uh, several of the OBGYNs in this audience, I'm very proud to say, are pediatric and adolescent gynecologists. And they have been members of, if not in positions of um, committee uh, leadership for that group, which is under the SOGC umbrella. And then there's a North American Society of Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecology, and um, I've been actively involved in that organization for a long time, and I'm president-elect, which will mean I'll be president next year, and I think um, I will embrace that job and look towards an opportunity for um, maybe some collaboration in terms of this um, endeavor that we want to move forward. And I think, Marianne, do you want to make some comments about well, this too? You know what, I, I do have something that I think I can offer today that hasn't already been said, and I'm going to come off very selfish, but it's with the best of intentions I see to the patients here. Um, if you want to get, if you're a hematologist and you want to get an OBGYN to buy into this whole thing, mm -hmm. you know, um, there's ways to sell it to them. Um, um, one way is that both our Canadian Society of OBGYNs of Canada and their clinical practice guideline from 2005, which Dr. Seneca said will be updated, as well as the American College of OBGYNs of Canada support a multidisciplinary approach to women and bleeding disorders. So, but you know, there's other ways to get uh, OB-GYNs to buy into it. Um, it's been, you know, truly a rewarding part of my practice. 
uh, since I joined this team, and I think it'd be very rewarding academically as well as clinically. Uh, so if there's a, you know, an OBGYN, a junior faculty member who's looking for an academic niche, an opportunity to, uh, for their academic, um, you know, uh, passion, you can sell it on that basis. Uh, the patients are grateful, they're wonderful to deal with the people that you deal with and uh, the, all the allied healthcare professionals, et cetera, are great to work with. It allows me to use my skills in, um, and expertise in, in pediatric adolescent gynecology as well as adult gynecology and contraception. You know, it's very nice to be able to decant. You make the diagnosis. I'm talking to the hematologist here. <laughs> you make the diagnosis of the inherited bleeding disorder, and I will come and I will bring to the table, rule out coexisting or other gynecologic causes of the bleeding, um, and provide some sexual and reproductive health care at the same time. And then to bring to the table my comfort with management of um, menstrual disorders, whether that be the comfort with combined contraceptives, um, long acting progestins, the levonorgestrel intrauterine system, endometrial ablation or hysterectomy. And then when I do have to go to hysterectomy, it's just unbelievable to have the support from my patient, our patient, the support of the pre-printed orders and the nurse in the same day admission center ready, making sure that all the, the um, factors are being given on time and, <laughs> and that the post-op orders and the blood work that's supposed to be done is actually getting done and that's great. Um, I'm almost done. I, I think that um, uh, I get a free lunch once a month which is really nice and it's in an area in the hospital where my beeper does not receive pages so I go there willingly. Mm -hmm. Um, if now you really think I'm selfish, don't you? Um, no, where we really discuss the patients, but what they have done to bring me on board was they, they really valued my time as a team. They said, um, you know, we, when we're discussing the patients, we'll discuss all the women in bleeding disorder patients first, and then you can go, because, and don't, and when in the week could you do a clinic with us? When would it suit your schedule? And because they had a little, I get the sense they might have had a little bit more flexibility with their clinic time than I did. So. And, the, and they field the patient phone calls through their office and they, they manage the charts. Um, and my final thing is, this, you know, is a practical point of view. Um, I, I, you have to think, you go to school a long time, you want to be able to earn a living. And um, when I don't think you, there should be any financial penalty to get involved as an ob -GYN in some kind of endeavor like this. And I'm on a, um, a fixed salary, so to speak, but um, we do shadow bill, so, you know, I, I bill, sorry, a practical point, I bill a consult every time I see a patient, because Paula consults me, and that helps me to earn my keep, so to speak. You thought I was only going to say something. Awesome. Words, didn't you? <laughs> I had no idea you were going to say that much. That's awesome. <laughs> so, um, Marianne is a skilled surgeon and a talented physician who has some skills that I'm learning from. She is so efficient in clinic, and yet every single patient feels like they got enough of her time. It's unreal. She's also a ton of fun. And so there was discussion about fun earlier, and I completely echo that. We have a ball in this clinic. So um, I think we're dedicated to this because it improves patient care. I think there are academic opportunities, and we're really delighted to be here. So thank you. I do promise to open up the questions after, but we will take one question right now. I, I just want to make one comment, uh, just adding uh, that Marianne has put forward. SOGC every year offers uh, about eight to 10 scholarships of five to $8,000. Um, members of our organization, whether they're OBGYN, family doctor, nursing, or midwifery, who want to take some time off uh, and do six to eight weeks in a specialty area to get some extra training. We had requests for menopause clinics, minimally invasive surgery, et cetera, and certainly for individuals who want to spend some time in a special clinic uh, uh, such as this one would be well covered by a grant. And you know what? We never get the full amount of requests every year. So I want 
to thank the Kingston Clinic. Again, we'll, open, we'll have some general questions at the end. I'm going to call on the last clinic, uh, Dr. Sue Robinson, to represent the Halifax Clinic. Are we going down? Thanks very much. Um, I represent our group, and uh, that's um, Vicki Price, who's the pediatric hematologist, Sue Van Oosten, who's the uh, nurse coordinator that works with, with um, the adult group, and Sue Ann Haas works with the pediatric group, and um, three gynecologists, gynecologist obstetric, uh, Nancy Van Eyck is here today, uh, Joan Winning, and uh, Jill Graves. And we're a virtual clinic in Halifax. Um, so on University Avenue, uh, which is where the university and the hospitals are, we're two doors apart. So uh, the adults are at the QE2, and the um, women's health and pediatrics is at the IWK. So um, in 2008, I think much to um, Vicki was a real ins ins um, was a was a big inspiration for the development of our virtual clinic when she. Uh, came on staff in, in um, I forget what exactly what year, but we finally um, got together and in 2008 um, we were funded by a CS, uh, CSL Bearing, thank you very much, for a visit with Rochelle and her group. And um, we, um, the four, the two um, hematologists and two nurses went up and uh, we had a great visit and saw this uh, model clinic. So then we eventually got ours going and we um, um, basically, we don't have patients, uh, patient clinics together. Um, we, it has very much opened the ability to um, refer patients back and forth. Uh, we have monthly meetings where we discuss the cases um, and interesting topics. And um, that's a bit of a challenge. We had to find a time that was okay with surgeons. And, um, and of course, they get up so early in the morning. Um, so, uh, but that's continued on and that's been um, a very, very helpful. Um, we, early on, um, we did start working on a protocol for uh, carriers with hemophilia and uh, the newborns and, and we worked together with our core group and also with the um, anesthetists and the uh, um, neonatal doctors, the, the geneticists, um, and I've probably left out a few, but we all got together and and met several times and came up with a couple of documents. And our challenge now is to disseminate um, that information. But it really has, I think we've all felt, um, uh, improved patient care. So now when we see the um, patients uh, prenatally and then during pregnancy, uh, these carriers, we are all sending letters to the same people. And as Rochelle said, I think it's really important within a department to identify a person who's going to carry the torch and have the knowledge. So the letters go specifically to a, a, a um, neonatologist and a, a medical geneticist, et cetera. And I think that really has uh, improved patient care. So no matter where the carrier um, comes into the system, whether it's through genetics or hematology or obstetrics um, or um, before pregnancy, Hopefully they they go through the, the down the same path. Um, I think uh, the other th big thing that we've done is we were able to um, successfully get uh, grant funding from CHS um, Care and Cure to do a, a clinical trial with women with menorrhagia, and it's looking at uh, the effect of cyclocapron, looking for the uh, minimum dose that's tolerated and effective, and in the end, hoping to see if we can see a difference um, between women who have bleeding disorders and women who don't have bleeding disorders. So that's ongoing. And the patients will come in through either of the, or, or one of the three clinics, the pediatric hematology, adult hematology, or the um, gynecology clinic. And I think either the recognition that we now have a women's clinic, or um, whether it's the study, I think, in all three clinics, we're seeing increased referrals, and that in itself is a challenge. Um, where do you see these patients? Where do you fit them in? And um, um, I think we're still dealing with that. As I talked before about the iron infusions, what's also led um, um, to uh, increased work, especially for um, Sue, is the follow-up of these patients that have iron deficiency 
And uh, I have one slide there. And this is um, a young girl that was 16, and um, her dad actually brought her in. He has uh, mild hemophilia, <clears throat> and he brought his daughter in. And <clears throat> sorry, her hemoglobin was in the in the 70s, and um, she really didn't uh, complain very much. But he thought she looked pale. And in the end, she had wicked periods, and she lived with her dad and never really talked to him about it. And um, <clears throat> so with, she couldn't tolerate uh, oral iron. She actually vomited. Uh, and we got her on IV iron. She had a needle phobia, so we had to just help her through that. So then she uh, normalizes her hemoglobin very nicely. And these are her ferritins. <clears throat> and we've reinstituted some iron here. So I was able to um, quickly call up one of my gynecology colleagues and have her seen the following day for these, for these terrible periods. So, so um, that worked out very well. Um, I think the, um, the other challenge that we are dealing with getting back to the referrals is with hematology. Um, I'm a general hematologist, and I'm the only one that, uh, that um, works with the bleeding disorders. Um, and so what the, we do take all our referrals from, um, probably the bulk of ours come from family physicians. We take them from, from everybody. And um, more and more, um, my colleagues, my other hematologists, are more um, or less, less willing to see some of these um, iron deficiencies, benign hematology, and more and more because of the load, the pressure's on to triage patients, and I think this is happening to other clinics. And um, so we, I think our, the fact that we have a combined clinic uh, for women with, with bleeding disorders, that's key, given cre uh, credence to allow us to keep these uh, women coming to us and see if we can offer them some help. Um, so I think I'll, I'll stop there, and there may be some questions. So thank you very much. We actually have about, I think, 10 minutes or so for questions. Um, if the questions, if the discussion gets heated, we can go a little bit over time into the coffee break, but I hope not to go too much over. We've caught up almost uh, uh, perfectly. <laughs> Um, I'd like to open up the questions, uh, if not, uh, if we have some questions regarding the way to function, how to start a clinic, uh, how to make things work, uh, what you like, what you don't like, uh, any suggestions to make things better, um, anything at all? Dr. Quaiz? Yeah, I have a question not to really challenge you, Paula, but how does it exactly improve uh, patient care in terms of what are your metrics? since? Um, Years ago, um, we had a combined clinic, and um, at least our unofficial metrics was, you know, patient satisfaction, and um, we had to abandon it because uh, time and again, these patients were losing their uh, prior existing relationship with their OBGYN um, because it would be awkward for another OBGYN to kind of take over the care. Maybe this is different, um, you know, across the border in terms of your arrangements. I, someone, I think it was mentioned, Dr. Frank you mentioned that I didn't quite understand what you mentioned passing your relationship with the primary, you know, OBGYN, but sometimes, you know, that could be awkward. And also, just as a practical measure, we got feedback that we had kind of a lot of nerve to tell patients to come in at a certain time of, you know, the year of, of the month, you know, for this clinic, you know, a certain, you know, time frame when they're working and they're, they have, you know, their full lives. and. Uh, you know, it's hard to, you know, force somebody to come in a certain time. It's a little bit easier in the hemophilia uh, center model, severe hemophiliacs, where we have our Friday morning multidisciplinary clinic. But in this situation, it wasn't very, you know, practical. And then the important thing is just communication. I think what's helped us is that patients know they can contact us, and because we're a relatively small community, we can just get on the phone with the, um, you know, uh, affiliated uh, OBGYN who's taking care of them. 
in uh, a common situation we find is, because I just want to backtrack and say that in theory this is great what you're doing because what happens is that patient often feels they're caught in the middle. A very common scenario where they're caught in the middle is uh, menomenorrhagia, inovatory heavy menstrual bleeding, where they first call their OBGYN, and now that they have this label of a bleeding disorder, they immediately, or at least the triage nurse, tells them, no, you have to call the hemophilia center because it's a bleeding problem. And then when we get the history that it's really spotting for uh, you know, 21 days, that's not primarily because of underlying von Willebrand's. There must be a hormonal component, and they really need you know, input of the OB. So I think in that sense, it's good uh, to have a close cooperation. But as a practical issue, um, how do you deal with you know, the fact that the, the doctor, you know, they already may have a primary OBGYN in a very good relationship with that? So just to answer the first question, how do I know that this clinic improves patient care? Because the patients tell me it's patient satisfaction, and I don't have uh, it, that's a subjective comment. I don't have, I, I haven't studied this. I don't have firm data to support that. In terms of um, how do you deal with the issue that the patient may already have a gynecologist, I think probably the way our healthcare systems are set up, it, it underscores why there are differences here. I mean, um, we are salaried in Kingston. We have to shadow bill, as Marianne mentioned. But I think the sensitivities about stealing patients are probably not as strong um, because of how we get paid in Kingston that there might be if there's other models of payment. If somebody gets referred to me by a gynecologist, we just have a conversation. And so Marianne and I will talk with the gynecologist and say, do you want to continue providing gynecologic care or do you want this to come under the umbrella of the clinic? And Marianne's holding her hand up, so I, she's got something to add here. <laughs> Did that answer right. the question? There was the third question about testing during the uh, menstrual period. Is it, there was a third point. Is it, no? No, nope, that's no, it. Thanks. Thank you. Hi. Go ahead. Um, I have a question for all of the clinics, and I just wanted to make a comment first. Um, I think the letters that you're sending out for pregnant women in Calgary are amazing. And um, the care that we've had in the London and Toronto clinics as someone with dysfibrinogenemia um, has just completely changed our lives, really, for me, my mom, and my sisters. Um, and I'm wondering, we had the same experience as Karen, who spoke earlier with the real gap in care, where we were all diagnosed in the 80s, but no one knew what it was. So, you know, you would tell the doctor and their eyes just kind of glaze over and, well, that's kind of interesting. You know, we might use some extra packing or, you know. And it wasn't until four years ago my sister had a major car accident and just by a stroke of bad luck, good luck, it was in London. Um, so when she was bleeding heavily, she was right there where there was a bleeding disorder clinic. And I'm wondering what kind of outreach you do to, especially rural doctors, um, the medical community outside of city centers, because we're still three hours outside of Toronto. And it's always really challenging, even though we're all really outspoken and we have all the information now. Um, a lot of them don't seem interested or they don't have the time like my family doctor does nursing home rounds, delivers babies, and has a practice. So I he doesn't know, you know much about it. I think that I'm going to actually defer to, to my colleagues at the CHS. I don't know if either of you are willing to comment on, on what type of activity, because the, the Canadian Hemophilia Society does uh, numerous workshops, um, and also to educate, I think, uh, in the community as well. I don't know if someone here would like to comment on that first before. David? I think we can do a lot more, and I think that's going to be the role of the, uh, the ambassadors group. Uh, it's been sort of hit and miss. Uh, there have been some excellent uh, women in bleeding disorders conferences which have been uh, delivered regionally, so in the, in the Atlantic, uh, in the West, in Quebec and Ontario. 
uh, to raise awareness among, among women. But again, the, the numbers haven't been huge. We need to reach out to a lot more. So I think some of the, the, some of the things that have been talked about today in terms of reaching out to schools uh, and those kinds of things are important. Uh, and I, I think uh, another thing that's been really successful has been the work we've done uh, in attending some of the uh, family physicians meetings, uh, emergency physicians meetings, SOGC meetings. We have a, a, a booth there. Uh, and uh, we get to speak to about a thousand doctors at a time, and they remember what they what you know what what they hear and what they receive, and so I think that's really made a difference uh, in terms of awareness. And we've done some some studies in terms of awareness, you know, since 2002 or three, when we started, and and uh, you know, the level of awareness among physicians is much much higher about things like like VWD than it was uh, you know 10 years ago. Thank you. I just wanted to make a comment. Um, you know, there's a way to talk to uh, your doctor without uh, being uh, arrogant or <laughs> offensive. And unfortunately, they don't, sometimes they don't listen because doctor listen to doctor. They don't listen to patient. That's how they were taught. But you know, your power is the letter that we send you. We say, I, unfortunately, you don't do that in the United States. You don't know what you miss. But you know, it's a very powerful tool because when a patient comes with a, doc, a letter from a specialized clinic, they read it and they do what's written inside. So keep your letter, even though it's 15 years old. Most of it is still there and needs to be followed and. At, it's going to give you some uh, credit when you have the impression that the doctors don't want to listen to you. But I just want to give you a little um, um, encouragement. Yeah, en encouragement, because nowadays we teach residents in uh, what we call uh, transversal uh, competencies that they need to talk with patients and listen to them. And you know, we have patients coming with internet review about that uh, thick, uh, about any kind of disorder. So you people with bleeding disorder, you know your disease because this is probably the thing that I was most impressed when we started this uh, bleeding disorder clinic with Dr. Rivard the first time I went to the uh, weekend family uh, program, I was impressed by the amount of knowledge that the family had, even though they had absolutely no training in medicine or nursery or whatever. We have time for two short questions, and then we'll have to stop for a coffee break. Okay, well, this is mostly just a quick comment. I'm Melissa Mirosh. I'm a general gynecologist in Saskatoon. We have a fledgling women with bleeding disorders clinic there. It's been running maybe a year, give or take. We've had two clinics, and it's uh, it's amazing to me. We're a province of a million people, so we have one center in Saskatoon that covers everybody. Um, and as a gynecologist, if you want to hook us in, we're simple people. We're surgeons. We like to fix stuff. And although you can't fix hemophilia, you can sure fix a lot of the stuff that goes with it, like the menorrhage and whatnot. It's been amazing. We've already found one gynecologic cancer. I've had three significant gynecologic surgeries come out of this clinic of maybe 15 people. Um, and so it's a very high pickup of people who need stuff done and stuff that we can really help with and make a difference with. And I think uh, one of the things you hear across here is that how happy the patients are to, oh my God, finally somebody believes me, you know, and somebody can do something about this. And I mean, as gynecologists, we love that. It's like, yeah, fixed, woohoo. So, <laughs> you know, if, if you wanna bring us in, that's it. I mean, it just took one, one phone call from Dr. Bros uh, from hematology there and, you know, done deal, so. Thank you very much. We. Uh, just we have two, two uh, seconds. quick because we have Very one, quick. one person. So I'm the nurse with the clinic. I'm Colleen, and we totally appreciate that we have only had the two clinics. And uh, I just wanted to say, from a younger person's perspective, this is how fast it gets out to the world. I had an 18 year old come to clinic, and within hours of her going home, it was on Facebook. What a wonderful experience it was for her. So, <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to say thank Twitter you. And Facebook. <laughs> thank you very much, and we will continue on. Just one last comment from Shelley. Okay, I, I just want to speak behalf on behalf, I'm hoping it's okay, of the women sitting in the first two rows here as Code Rouge ambassadors that, um, that we're hoping to be part of the clinics that are currently set up or possibly being set up, the multidisciplinary clinics, that will be part of your team. That when we give the clinics business cards, that the women that they're affecting 
um, because of the emotional toll and the confusion that these women are going through, especially the psychological effects, that we can be there to talk to them and be lend a hand to have a shoulder to cry on and, and to really really be there with them because we've all been through it. And, and that's really important that the Coase Rouge ambassadors be part of that. Thank you.